Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. The early 90s were an amazing time for music. Generation X, a powerful demographic force, reached the age where they were in a position to demand music that reflected their needs, wants, wishes, desires, and fears. The biggest sea change came with the rise of grunge, thanks to Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, and of course Nirvana. But that music was just the kickstart for the alternative nation that came to dominate most of the 90s. For many, grunge was alternative music with training wheels. Those who liked what they heard were invariably led deeper into a culture that had existed outside the mainstream for years. Gen X discovered different flavors of goth and industrial and electronic music. And they discovered punk. Now, punk had always been around. Sure, it kind of got burned out at the end of the 70s, but it never died. The Ramones kept touring, bands like Husker Du were putting out records, and American hardcore established itself as a force to be reckoned with. But punk was still a niche thing, away from the attention of most music fans. But then an interesting set of circumstances came into play that resulted in a massive resurrection in interest in punk rock. And echoes of that resurrection are still being felt today. This is Chapter 6 of our look back at the 1990s. It's the mid-90s punk revival. This is the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Time for Chapter 6 of our 90s retrospective. I'm Alan Cross, and this time we're concerned with the punk rock of the decade. Now, while punk rock never really went away, it experienced a massive renaissance beginning in the spring of 1994. In other words, things got moving, and around the same time, Kurt Cobain died. Okay, wait, back up. By the beginning of 1994, the original grunge thing was looking very close to being beaten to death. The number of derivative bands really began to multiply. Too many grunge-like bands and grunge-light bands, as many of the actual grunge bands were starting to lose momentum. Many people forget this, but Nirvana fatigue had set in. Too much complaining by Kurt, too much drama with Kurt and Courtney, and In Utero, the follow-up to Nevermind, had been a, well, a sales disappointment. And then in April 1994, Kurt died, and that brought nothing but hurt and confusion to the whole grunge and grunge-like community. Reluctantly, though, it was time to move on, to find something new. It was time for the next, next big thing. Nirvana was primarily of the genus grunge, but whenever they could, they made it known that their attitude was total punk rock in the tradition of the Ramones, The Clash, and any number of hardcore bands from the 1980s. This sort of softened everyone up for what was to come next. And a band from Oakland had the right sound. They also had the right attitude and the right album at exactly the right time. And that band was Green Day. They had a couple of indie releases, but weren't exactly setting the world on fire. But then they met a producer named Rob Cavallo. He convinced Green Day that the only way forward was for them to sign with a major label. He'd signed the Goo Goo Dolls, and his dad had once managed the Love and Spoonful in Earth, Wind & Fire, And after hearing some Green Day, he offered them $300,000, and that was without ever seeing them play live. So, going against the ethos of the punk culture they had grown up in, Green Day signed. That was a huge risk, and it got them banned from some of the places they used to play. As far as a lot of Bay Area punks were concerned, Green Day was dead to them. They were sellouts. The group burned through the recording sessions with Cavallo in three weeks, and on February 1st, 1994, a record called Dookie appeared in stores, and it got some good reviews. Then, two months later, Kurt dies. A void, a vacuum opened up, and Green Day got sucked into it. Their brand of punk had a lot of the rebelliousness and anger of grunge, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. A lot of it sounded fun, in a snotty sort of way, and grunge was fun, said no one ever. Another thing, by 1994, the bad economy that had dragged down Generation X had turned around, and after 12 years of Republican rule, a Democrat was in the White House. Bill Clinton seemed like a cool dude. Hey, he was a musician who played the saxophone. The overall mood was better, and music began to reflect that. Now remember that music is a cultural feedback loop, and listening to the dominant music of an era can tell you a lot about what was going on in society at the time. So Green Day's Dookie Turned out to be the right diversion at the right time, but nobody expected it to stay on the charts for two years and sell more than 20 million copies. (laughs) 
It's hard to overstate how much of an effect and influence Dookie had on a generation of music fans. Maybe you're one of the people who list Dookie as the album that changed your life. Maybe Dookie inspired you to form a band. Maybe it was the gateway drug for a life of listening to punk rock. If so, you're not alone. This record was definitely a monster, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger with each passing month. Of the 14 tracks on Dookie, 15 if you count the goofy hidden tracks sung by Trey Cool right at the end, five were released as singles. It won a Grammy for Best Alternative Album, and for many fans, it defined an era in their lives. The album was also a gateway into similar music, so much so that all of a sudden, California punk was the new thing. Green Day was the biggest band of the 90s rock revival, but they were hardly the only one. Rancid, another band from the Bay Area, got swept away too. This pleased Green Day to no end because everyone in the band had been big fans of Rancid, as well as Operation Ivy, Rancid's immediate ancestor. As kids, Billy Joe Armstrong and Mike Durnt used to go see Op Ivy all the time at the infamous 924 Gilman Street punk club. Rancid came together in 1991, once Op Ivy disbanded after a couple of years. And as Green Day was blowing up, they chatted up Rancid whenever they could. But unlike Green Day, Rancid chose to stay indie, recording for Bad Religion's Epitaph Records. But because of the huge vortex formed around Green Day, Rancid was sucked up into the stratosphere anyway, thanks largely to MTV. They went looking for more songs like Basket Case and Longview, and that's when they found Rancid and Salvation. Rancid from Let's Go, their second album, which came out five months after Dookie. Good timing, because by then, there was this growing appetite for this new resurrected form of American punk rock. Rancid were a little older, too, with a couple of members pushing 30. They were seen as the older brothers, the elder statesmen of the scene. And that brought them a certain amount of respect. And through Rancid, a lot of kids were led back to the original British punks of the 1970s, like The Clash. Big, spiky mohawks were seen at a lot of Rancid shows, something that had gone out of fashion for a while. Let's Go wouldn't be anywhere as big as Dookie. It peaked at number 97 on the album charts, but it did sell more than a half a million copies, a huge amount for an indie band like this. The third band in this holy trinity was The Offspring. They'd first come together as a group called Manic Subsidal in the Huntington Beach area of Orange County, south of Los Angeles. Basically, they were three high school kids and the school's janitor. That was Noodles, the guitarist, and apparently he got into the band because he was the only one cool enough or old enough to buy everyone else beer. That's how we got into the group. Everyone was into California hardcore, the punk that evolved out of the original punk of the 1970s. The scene was small but fierce, and its adherents stuck together. And some of this music became the soundtrack for skaters and snowboarders. Dead Kennedys, The Adolescents, The Vandals, Black Flag, Bad Religion. Really niche stuff at the time. And certainly stuff that never made it on the radio. After a drummer change, the original dude went off to learn how to be a gynecologist. Seriously. They began recording demos and tossing off cassettes that they'd sell at gigs. If you can find original copies of the six songs in Tehran cassettes, you've actually got something pretty collectible. Those tapes resulted in a quick deal with a tiny label called Nemesis. That led to a second deal with Epitaph, the indie label founded by Bad Religion. Their first album with them was self-titled, and like everything else that had come before, got some decent reviews from the hardcore faithful. The skaters and the boarders liked them too. But it was the third album that had the offspring at the right place at the right time. When the Smash record was released on April 8, 1994, it started slow. And the only people who noticed it were those skaters and snowboarders who heard an Offspring song or two that had been picked up for a couple of boarding videos. But that was okay because it got the band a sweet gig playing for a bunch of snowboarders up in Alaska. And it was while they were away that things got kind of crazy. When Green Day and Rancid were starting to make inroads into the mainstream, the hunt was on for similar bands. And one of their songs, one of the Offspring songs, had somehow made it onto an L.A. radio station and was getting a massive response. Then MTV called. Where's the video? So Epitaph sunk $5,000 into making a quickie clip. And that's when all hell broke loose. Hey! The man you me. Take you you gotta keep a 
Come Out and Play, the first single from The Offspring's 1994 album Smash. And this would be a good time to mention a guy named Jason McClain. He was a forklift operator who was The Offspring's number one fan. No matter where the band played, Jason was guaranteed to be in the audience. So, as a reward, the band gave him a small part in that song. And that's Jason that says, you gotta keep them separated. By August 1994, this is six months into Smash's existence, The Offspring, who had trouble selling a few thousand copies of their earlier records, were now selling that many every few hours. To put it another way, their Ignition album sold a grand total of 60,000 copies. Smash was selling that number every three days. This was staggering. In 1994, no indie band sold records in these amounts. One million 2 million, 5 million, 9 million, 11 million. And now current estimates are that Smash has worldwide sales of around 20 million records. Now, it's tough to confirm global numbers, but it's safe to say that Smash is the second highest selling indie release in the history of the world. And it stayed that way for a decade and a half. From the way I see it, only Adele has sold more. Yes, Adele is an indie artist. Her home label is XL, part of the Beggar's Banquet Group out of the UK. There were four singles from Smash that were all over the radio and video channels for years. And along with what Green Day was doing, it attracted millions of ears to this new era in punk rock. Smash and Dookie changed everything. By the time we got to 1995, this modern brand of punk had displaced grunge as the top alt-rock sound. And it was only going to get bigger as the sounds got broader. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. You're listening to the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. This is Chapter 6 in our look back on the alt-rock of the 1990s, and we're in the middle of discussing the decade's punk rock revival. We have the holy trinity of Green Day, Rancid, and The Offspring. And whenever gold is struck in a particular genre, you know what happens next, right? Yeah, there's, there's a stampede to sign anyone who might have a chance of being the next in line for stardom. After years of ignoring this modern form of punk rock, the major labels were content to leave this stuff to small indie labels, they came a-hunting for more of this next big thing. And the result was some very good bands who had been around for a very long time finally got a shot at the big time. As Rancid, Green Day, and The Offspring were starting to gain momentum, another California band was finally teetering on something great. Social Distortion had been plugging away without a whole lot of success since 1978. Leader Mike Ness was, um, well, unpredictable and prone to hawking the band's equipment for drugs. But after finally acquiring some savvy management, Social D found their footing, signed to a major label, and started putting out alt-rock radio hits like this. Social Distortion and I Was Wrong from a 1996 album called White Light, White Heat, White Trash. By the way, they were managed by the same people as The Offspring, so when that group took off, Social D was caught in their updraft. Much to their benefit, of course. Another old-timey group that received new attention was Bad Religion. They'd become legends with the hardcore crowd, especially with their DIY attitude towards making and releasing records. Their label, Epitaph, was one of the most important indie labels of the era. By the time 1994 rolled around, they had released seven albums and a ton of singles. Their eighth album came out as all the punk hoo-ha was happening, and they too were caught up in the wave. And in a weird twist... The album wasn't released on Epitaph. For a bunch of weird reasons, it was released on Atlantic, part of Warner's, one of the major label conglomerates. The record was called Stranger Than Fiction, and it became the only bad religion album to go gold. Bad Religion, established 1979, peaked 1994-95, and still touring and still making records. Other punk bands to get attention during the middle 90s included Face to Face, MXPX, Pennywise, Phoenix TX, and Unwritten Law. They didn't sell records in the numbers that we saw with some of these other groups, but you know what? They did okay. 
This brings us to No Effects, who had been around since 1983 and had been releasing records on Epitaph since 1989. Their biggest record was Punk in Drublick from 1994, which went gold in both Canada and the U.S. And this single even got some radio play. No effects, led by singer Fat Mike, still a going concern today. Another punk group who found themselves in more demand was Fugazi, a band from the Washington, D.C. area that practiced a form of punk rock called Straight Edge. No drugs, no booze. Plus, they were total do-it-yourselfers. They held the entire record industry in contempt and wanted nothing to do with the way it operated. So they did everything on their own, through their own label, which they called Discord. Lots of all-ages shows. Lots of shows where tickets cost practically nothing. And lots of emotional intensity with their music. Fans would later take cues from bands like Fugazi when the whole emo sound came around a little bit later. Here's an example of what Fugazi sounded like. Some alternative radio stations, commercial radio stations, had this one in rotation for a while. It's from an album entitled In On The Kill Taker. And this is Cassavetes. <laughs> Ian McKay and Fugazi with a track called Cassavetes. They probably didn't like it much, but even they found themselves sucked into the mid-90s punk rock revival. And so were the Ramones. Their rediscovery is really important to this story. The Ramones were at their peak in the middle and late 70s, but they spent almost the entire 80s in total obscurity. No one cared about the Ramones. In fact, they were not only considered washed up, but a joke. But the Ramones kept at it, releasing album after album and going on tour after tour. But then a funny thing happened when grunge hit in the early 1990s. All these new bands, led by kids like Kurt Cobain and Eddie Vedder, started name-checking the Ramones. They were seen wearing Ramones t-shirts. Later, bands like Green Day and The Offspring would do the same. And whenever they could, they'd sing the praises about the Ramones and how they were pioneers and the creators of punk rock, which to a large extent is very, very true. This rediscovery of the Ramones by a generation at least once removed from the original punks brought the Ramones back into the mainstream. The outpouring of affection and attention was so strong that by 1996, they were one of the main stage stars of the Lollapalooza Festival. <laughs> The Ramones, live on the 1996 Lollapalooza Tour. Later that summer, they would play their last show in Hollywood, bringing the curtain down on a career that included 2,263 shows. It was good to see them get the recognition they deserved after so many years in the wilderness, and it was good to see Joey and Johnny be acknowledged for their contributions before they died. There was a lot of punk rock around back then, and not all of it was of the hard and fast variety. I'll show you what I mean next. Now, back to the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Punk rock is not just a sound. It's an attitude, an aesthetic, a philosophy, a way of life. And unless your flavor of punk rock is governed by rigid dogma, like we saw with some hardcore and early emo scenes, this music can give you license to try all kinds of different sounds. The mid-90s punk rock revival wasn't just about two and three chord songs played angry and fast people started paying attention to groups like Blink-182, who were very punk in their attitude, but also quite pop in their songwriting. Blink came out of San Diego in the early 1990s, and by the end of the decade, they were one of the biggest American bands in the world, with a growing list of hit singles. When their 1999 album, Enema of the State, came out, it would eventually sell 15 million copies. In addition to the pop-punk of Blink-182, there was a long list of groups that incorporated reggae and ska into their vision of what punk rock could be, 
If you recall your music history, this is exactly what happened with the original punks in the 1970s. I mean, The Clash started out as two chord wonders, but then started experimenting with dub. There were groups like The Slits, who were born at a punk rock show and channeled everything through reggae. And then there were all the ska bands at the end of the 70s, all inspired by the original ideals of punk, the specials, the English beat, madness. And so it was in the middle 1990s. The punky end of grunge gave way to full-on punk revivalists, and that begat a new generation of ska punks. The Muddy Muddy Bostones, Real Big Fish, No Doubt, and Sublime. Now let's talk about them for a moment. Sublime was one of the great lost alt-rock bands of the decade. They were formed in 1988 and muscled through countless gigs, building up a substantial grassroots following. By 1996, their reputation was bolstered by being thrown off the Warp Tour for being too disrupted. Now let's just think about that for a second. They were ready for prime time. After two indie albums, they scored a major deal, and the thinking was that they could be as big as The Offspring or Green Day. They recorded a self-titled album in the late winter and spring of 1996, and those who heard it in advance thought this was going to be a killer record when it was scheduled for release that summer. They had just finished it, and I mean just finished it, when singer Brad Knoll died of a heroin overdose on May 25, 1996, at the Ocean View Motel in San Francisco. He'd been an addict for some time, but he was used to Mexican brown tar heroin. What he injected that day was far stronger, and he died. That was seven days after he got married and a couple of months since the birth of his son. Since Brad died, there have been a bunch of Sublime albums, mostly featuring stuff that had already been recorded, two of them going platinum or gold. That's why I call Sublime one of the great lost bands of the 90s. Who knew what more they could have done had Brad lived? That's when things got out of control. She didn't want to. He had his way. She said, let's go. He said, no way. Come on, babe. It's your lucky day. Shut your mouth. We're going to do it my way. Come on, baby. Don't be afraid. Day rape, I'd never get 90s punk wasn't confined to just the United States. Canada got in the act, too. Gob came out of Langley, B.C., and built a career that peaked in about 2003. There was Jersey out of Burlington, Ontario, a criminally underrated band. Some 41 started up in 1996 and went on to sell 30 million records. And then we have Montreal's Doughboys. They even toured with the Offspring during the crazy days of Smash. Their big record was Crush from the summer of 1994. And this was the single. From the summer of 1994, the Doughboys and Shine, the album was Crush. There's one more form of 90s punk that we need to acknowledge, and that's the whole Riot Girl scene. Now, we did cover this in some detail on the chapter on the women of the 90s, but we have to also include these groups here. We can't say that any of the Riot Girl groups were commercially successful, but we can say they were critically praised and very influential when it came to the next generation of bands. There were groups like Bikini Kill, Team Dresh, Huggy Bear, and Heavens to Betsy. The scene was too intense to really hold together for long, and by the end of the 90s, the Riot Girl community had splintered into a million different pieces. But if we have to single out one group as being the most prolific, it would probably have to be Sleater Kinney, a trio from Olympia, Washington, and one of the originators of the entire Riot Girl community. If you're at all interested in the punk rock of the 90s, do yourself a favor and take a deep dive into Sleater Kinney. Let me play you this, and I've chosen this because it kind of closes the loop on the whole punk thing that we've been talking about. It's from the group's 1996 album entitled Call the Doctor, And it's I Want to Be Your Joey Ramone. Sleater Kinney and I Want to Be Your Joey Ramone from 1996. The punk rock revival of the 90s peaked through 1994 to 1996 before it ran out of gas with the general public, with the exceptions of a few bands. Green Day, Offspring, Blink-182. But in their wake came a long, long list of punk bands, many of which are still with us today. In fact, it's certainly not a stretch to say the groups like Simple Plan, Fall Out Boy, My Chemical Romance, and many others wouldn't have existed had it not been for what happened 
in the middle 1990s. We'll be feeling the impact from those few years for quite some time yet. Back in a moment. More of the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. So far on this series on the alt-rock of the 1990s, we've covered everything from grunge to punk, from Riot Girls to Britpop, and all the influences we saw come from the hip-hop side of the ledger. But there's still more to talk about. Like I said a while back, grunge was like alternative rock with training wheels. Once it pulled you into this universe and you had a chance to look around, you realized that there were all kinds of new, fresh, strange, and fascinating sounds that existed under the umbrella of alt-rock. Things like goth, industrial, shoegaze, lo-fi, even singer-songwriters that didn't fit the mainstream's view of rock. And that will be our focus for Chapter 7, the other genres that we collectively discovered in the alt-rock 90s. Until then, you can visit me at my website, which is ajournalofmusicalthings.com. I update that thing every day. I'm also available through Facebook and Twitter. I post a lot. And I'm even lurking about on Instagram and Google+. Don't forget that ongoing history shows can be downloaded as podcasts. You should subscribe. iTunes seems to be the place most people go, and I can be found on email anytime through alan at alancross.ca. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast at iTunes and through Google Play.